haven't been to the all new mickandarty.com check it out you can stream the show 24 7 plus we're posting videos podcasts pictures and tweets all in real time we're live right now on mickandarty.com welcome back Nick and Artie show joining us right now in studio. He's a comedian, author, a host of web video blog Jeff Gorian's Comedy, and the new bestseller Make 'Em Laugh, which is the history of the comic strip, a great club here in New York City. Jeff Gorian, how are you, man? I'm great, Nick. How are you? Uh, good to see you. Hey, it's good to see you too. It's been a while, and I'm so happy to see that you guys are in this fa fabulous studio. I mean, we yeah, did some new digs. We did something right, huh, Jeff? Look at us. I mean, my God. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's incredible. No, we're, I mean, we're thrilled with it. We're thrilled with it. Most people hate where they work. I could see where you wouldn't want to leave here, man. It's There's it's actually, fun. Jeff, behind you, so there's beds that you can't see that come out of those walls, Murphy beds, with a Red Sox and Yankees emblem. I like yeah. it. I, li and, I mean, uh, it's... Already broken, already broken the couch. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I banged the broad on the couch, right? So, we're, I mean, well, listen, everything's fine. <laughs> Absolutely. What else could you do here? So, it's Jeff, perfect. you wrote this book, Make Him Laugh. Describe your history with you and the comic strip, one of the best clubs. Nick and I know it well, yeah, obviously. Yeah, it's an amazing, uh, amazing club. You know, the book, it took actually took four years to do. I know. You've been wor working on this a long time. And it was so cool that I ran into Richard Lewis here before because Richard wrote a blurb for the back of the book. That's what I said. I, yeah, and I didn't get a chance to give him one, so I happened to have an extra one. Oh, you so saw it was him? perfect. Yeah, Good. Right. yeah he Good. came out to see me because we're old, old friends. And so it's so cool. In 2008, I'm in the strip and I'm with Richie Tinkin, the owner and the founder yep. of the club, the guy who discovered Eddie Murphy and Chris Rock and managed Eddie for the better part of his early the career. The club opened like 76. June 1st to 76. Yep. Yeah. June 17th, Seinfeld walked into audition. So, and we we have his first sign up sheet. In those yeah, it's days, in the book, the picture. In of those it. days, yeah. they graded you right. when you came to I audition. That, to that was a you... very. Can I say, as comics, I know I don't know if Nick had a similar uh, experience as a comedian with Lucian there in the Lucian yeah. days. It was yeah. a very nerve wracking place to audition, man. It was, he was really judgmental, man. especially with Lucian. Yeah, right? yeah. he yeah. came up to and me when I auditioned, everybody... and he said, "Lucian said we already have an Italian American comedian, oh, yeah, Rich Fancesi. <laughs> I have enough white guys." <laughs> yes, yeah, he, he says said that. that he, he, he said to me, "He goes, yeah. I have a, a Belushi type. He goes, I need a laugh from you every 14 seconds." I think he said. <laughs> Did he really? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and the amazing thing was that he, that he started out as a Broadway dancer. He wasn't a comic guy. It makes guy. complete sense. Oh, he was yes. a Broadway dancer and a carpenter, <laughs> and he actually helped build the club. Right. You know? So, and, and then he got to run it one well, day. Well, because because when Richie went to L.A. with Eddie, he wasn't he couldn't book the club. Was, he was Richie the club managing the Eddie Murphy? Yeah, for 11 years. He managed him from his days on SNL through Beverly Hills Cop 2. Now, was Richie the manager who Eddie sued? Or, was so, or, or, or yeah, did Richie yeah. sue him because coming to America was his idea or something? Is there he the a, guy? There was a complication that he got fired in like 86, 87, yeah. Yeah. after Beverly Hills Cop 2. And he was like a, a father to Eddie. It was a very uncomfortable situation. Right. You know? Um, but in, in 1986, that's how Chris Rock got discovered. Eddie came in one night. And at the time, he was the biggest star in the world. He was Elvis, maybe. Yeah. You know? Eddie Eddie Murphy was yeah. the top yeah. of it, yeah. Top of, the, top of the world. And he came in one night, and they were always thrilled when Eddie was there because the audience would be freaked out, like sure. Eddie Murphy's here. Yeah. So he comes in, and he goes, are there any black comics I can see? And in those days, believe it or not, there were hardly any black comics, just a few. I believe it. And the only one there was Chris Rock, 19 years old, and he was setting up chairs in exchange for stage time. He just happened to be there that just night. Happened, well, he was there every night, right. but he was setting up chairs. And he had never performed before a big audience. He performed, you know, three in the morning for six drunks. You know what late night oh, is like. Yeah. I we, performed we, at two people there one night. I did a couple. Right. I sat at their table with a microphone. <laughs> I, I, see, I should have done that. You know, Nick, I, I, I did two people. I did a couple one night. It was just two people. Two and people. I swear to you, Nick, after I got off stage, I said, I should have done what you just said. I said, I should have sat at the table with them. I made the mistake of playing to them. I like, gave well, I did. I gave him a choice. I, I did about a minute, and I said, do you want me to come down there? And they you said, yes. a minute of material, <laughs> yes. and then you decided, let yes. me just join them and That's be part right. of it. Right? So yeah. Rock was in so, that hell. Yep. So Rock goes on stage, and it's a packed house, and he had never been before, and he knows Eddie's there, and Eddie's his idol, and he goes on stage, oh and he kills God. it. That is, he that kills is it. Him. He goes, I wasn't as funny as Joe Bolster. But because he keeps it in this whole interview, he's like, I was never as funny as Joe Bolster. He goes back to Joe Bolster. Saying that tongue in cheek, is he? I said, Joe Bolster's going to kill himself when he reads that. I mean, I actually know Joe's compliment. brother, Tom, an amazing talent, though. doesn't just Joe's have a great very, actor. And I like Joe. I but so he, he's got something against Joe Bolster. So, 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 so he's on stage and he hears Eddie <laughs> laughing in the background. And Eddie is waiting for him and he comes off stage and they sit in, in the, there's a big window seat in the front. And Eddie gives him his phone number and he says, Call me, man. Really? And Chris is like, he's already talking like I'm a star 
He's like, I've, I've never done anything yet. And he's already telling me about I'm going to buy my mother a house and stuff like that. So two days go by. He doesn't call Eddie. And he runs into, Chris runs into Louis Ferranda, who at that time we, was we, a bartender. We know Cash, Louis, right? Yeah. But now he works for Caroline's. been running Caroline's yeah. for many years. Great guy. Great, great guy. guy. Great yeah. guy. And word had gotten out through the comedy community that Eddie Murphy likes Chris Rock, right? Mm -hmm. So Louis is like, I heard Eddie likes you. He goes, yeah, he gave me his number. So Lewis is like, well, did you call him? He's like, no, I'm too nervous to call him. And Lewis I'd be is the like, same way. Schmuck, if, if Eddie Murphy gives you his number, call him. So yeah. he calls him that day, goes out with him that night with Eddie, with, with his, his mother and his whole entourage. They go to see Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. He said it was so long ago, Spike was out in the street selling T-shirts. Right? And then he says to him, you want to come to L.A.? I'm doing reshoots for Golden Child. So Chris is like... Should have reshot not. the whole thing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Chris is like, I'm from Bed-Stuy, man. I never was on a plane. I was never in a hotel. I never had a shrimp cocktail. He goes, my father used to buy one shrimp and cut it into seven pieces. Yeah. Because yeah. there were seven boys in our family, right? And so I said, well, did you go? He's like, yeah, man. I borrowed clothes. I went. They put him in this beautiful hotel, L'Hermitage. Right. And they noticed he wasn't ordering food. He thought he'd have to pay for it, and he had no money. <laughs> and Richie finally said, hey, man, it's on Paramount. Eddie's paying for it. Don't worry about it. It's on Paramount. And <laughs> wow. Imagine so yeah, Back in those Chris days, everything was on Paramount. Yeah. While he was out there, Eddie offered him a part. They actually created a part for him in Beverly Hills Cop 2, the valet. Right. Yeah. And that's what made his career. Let, let's stop there because we have to break and, and come back and pick up more cool. on, on what went on at the comic strip oh, in those cool. days. Yeah, and, I want to uh, hear like what, when you actually walked in there for the first time and what made you love it so much to yeah. write a book. You know? yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Talking to Jeffrey Gorian, it's Nick and Artie back up to this. I forgot to adjust the seat. I might be too low. We'll see. Okay. Thank you. The Nick and Artie Show is on DirecTV's Audience Network, Channel 239. If you like the radio show, you're going to love them on TV. Here are Nick DiPaolo and Artie Lang. Welcome back. Nick and Artie talking to author Jeffrey Gorian. The book is Make Them Laugh. It's the history of the comic strip. Great club here in New York City. Yeah, club Nick and I played many times. Where Eddie Murphy discovered it, among many others. Seinfeld. So so what's your history with the comic strip? How, when's the first time you go in there, and why do you like it so much that you write a book? I was there many years ago, over the, like, throughout the 80s, when I was writing for, like, Rodney. Uh, you would write early, jokes for Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield, right. in 1980. He was the first big star I ever wrote for. But wasn't it a and, competing club? He had a club on the Upper East Side, Dangerfield. Yeah, and, and as a matter of fact, that's about when he stopped going there. He became such a big star, he couldn't even appear <laughs> when he in bought his, his own, own club. When he, he bought was, his own club. <laughs> he was too big for his own club. Yeah, we used to hang out in the basement there when he, in his pajamas and his... Uh, of course. Yeah, he, he wore like a, a bathrobe. Not yeah, a nice he, bathrobe either, like a bathrobe and pajamas. That's he how came he in to catch a rising star one night with his robe on. Yeah, that's how it happened. And he goes, <laughs> my, the upper east side? my place is such a dump, I won't even play there. On the, goes, up, yeah, on the exactly. Upper East Side? Yeah. On the Upper East Side. <laughs> <laughs> got a drink in his hand. It's right near the strip. Oh, yeah. so Dangerfields has got it. Dangerfields to me is the oh, yeah. East Coast... Of comedy store. Co yes, I was just... I know. It seems trapped in the 70s with the velour and the, you well, know what I mean? It is depressing. Prom, it is. prom stuff. But in those days, it was like a major place. You know? So you're hanging out at the so, comic strip so yeah, in, and, in and, 1980. But I used to, yeah, and I used to go, um, I, and I'd say more from 85 when I moved to the city, 85 on, and I got very friendly with Lucian, and I was there. But this book, I just got the idea for it. And in 2008, I was at the strip one afternoon with Ann Curry and Gilbert Gottfried. And there's, we were coaching there's a crow. Ann, there's, well, we were coaching Ann on how to do stand-up comedy for some kind of contest that she was involved right. in. What an uphill battle that is. And she's actually funny, believe it or not. No, she she's not, but go funny. ahead. And I, anyway, <laughs> I look at the walls, and I'm just struck. I had been there so many years, but something about that day just struck me. I see Seinfeld and Ray Romano and Colin Quinn and Seinfeld, Susie Essman. I, I remember reading that Seinfeld had a really funny line uh, that he wrote on his headshot that's 
on the wall. He said to the comic strip, the only club I ever played that at one time was the only, the only club, club I, ever, I played. ever played. So he started there too. Even then, he started and he came in on the 17th. The club was open for two weeks, for right. 17 days, and they wrote good on his sheet. Yeah. Good, definitely invite back on Monday. That's what I'd write now. Yeah. Right, exactly. He was like, I'd write good. So I said, I said to Richie, hey, we should do a book on your club, man. You so know, you thought of writing a book. I thought of writing a book. Right. I proposed it to him. And I didn't know this, that other people had suggested it to him over the years, and he turned them down for whatever reason. He just wasn't into it. But for some reason, it struck him, and he came to my house. He trusted you. And my house is like a comedy museum. He saw that I had more pictures in my house than he had in the club, and he's like, I think you might be the guy to do the book. So I started that summer. I went up to Just for Laughs, and I got my first three interviews. Uh, Larry Miller was first, George Wallace. They were the guys who were there in the early days right. when Seinfeld just started. Larry, Larry Miller, Miller yeah, with George Wallace, yeah. and Paul Provenza, who was just a kid in those days. He used mm -hmm. to come in from Philadelphia to perform there. And it took the next three years to get all these other interviews. I flew out to L.A. to do Billy Crystal. Uh, most of the comics came to the club because there's something about sitting in those surroundings that brings back memories. Right. Like Paul That's Reiser right. remembered how their New Year's brunch started. They always argued, like, how did we start? You know, for 30 years... Every New Year's Day, Paul Reiser, Jerry Seinfeld, Mark Schiff, and Larry Miller get together. No, where, no matter where they are, they fly to New York and they have a brunch in Brooklyn and they walk over the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. And there was a what, guy, what day do they do this? Ju uh, January 1st. Really? Every year for 30 years. You think years. Seinfeld still does that? But nobody knows how it started. Right. And he said he remembered how, I know it, how it ended during the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Seinfeld got a billion dollars. He blows by yeah, him, you know, blows by him in a limo and beats him. <laughs> When when <laughs> when Paul Reiser first came to the club, he was dating a comic named Cara Leifer. There you go. And he said the next thing he knew, Jerry Seinfeld was dating Cara Leifer. She and got he around. never really knew how that happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She was comic relief. And I then she and then Ellen DeGeneres was dating Carol. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so the night before New Year's of 1980, um, Paul went over to Jerry and he put his hand out and he goes, "Let's put this Carol thing behind us. We should be friends." Let's put Carol behind us. Behind us. <laughs> well, because the two of them, that, it would make it easier for them to get together. <laughs> now, who, who approached who? Paul or Jerry? Paul put out his hand to, to Jerry, Jerry because they didn't really know each other well and there was this awkwardness between them. What year was this? And they're pretty similar. He said it was yeah. the New Year's night. New Year's Eve, the next day was January 1st, 1980. Oh, so neither one of them was when famous they yet. Do it. No, yeah. no. And 1980 was actually, right after that was when Seinfeld went to L.A. He stayed in New York for the first four years of his career, and that's, the comic strip was his home club. So you were there a lot, you were around the scene, and you decided to write this book, and it basically it's a book you need a lot of interviews for, right? It's, you know, Man, I did so many It took so you like interviews. three years, it right? Took, it took three years. Yeah. I wound up with 500 pages. The whole fourth year was editing. Because the publisher only wanted 250 pages. And how many so, did you have? 500? 500. You know what? I <laughs> That's a lot of editing. every interview, <laughs> man, by hand. Cause That's when you make a, an awkward phone call to Paul Provenza. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, no, you got. I mean, you know, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. It's, it's, it was such a huge amount of work. Well, how, and also, how do you cut out stories from Ray Romano? I had such great I don't stories. Know, how do you? So, or, and, and from all these other people. So that was good. That was you, good. you, you concentrate a lot on the generation before Nick and I, really. I mean, yeah, because well, that there's, was the there, there, there's a whole chapter on people from your generation, like Lisa Lampanelli. I call them the yeah. uh, the younger kids. You wouldn't consider she's in your generation. No, yeah, I'm she kidding. is. She's definitely in no, our generation. No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. She, there's like. Like, uh, yeah. Pete Dominic is in here. Tony oh, Rock, good. Gerard Small, Pete Dominic. He's like he's like a strong middle. Jim, Jim Brewer, <laughs> Gerard Small. He's Brewer, a, there you go. A Jim weak Brewer, middle. Jeffrey Ross, Jim Gaffigan, Judah Friedlander. Yeah. Judah. He was on your show the other yeah. night. Last night playing Last ping night. pong. Yeah. Now Lisa Lampanelli, Judah Friedlander, Gaffigan. Any women? <laughs> <laughs> But Susie Essman. Susie Essman, very There's very not a lot of women that came, I mean, you know. Now, you're a guy, you're still, days. you're a big fan. You know, I'm like a Jeffrey, you're a talented guy in your own right, you're a writer. But you are really a fan of stand-up. Like, I just saw you at Gotham the other night. You're well, always I, hanging around the clubs and people love you. Well, and You're a true fan of it. That's why you're good to write this book. Thank you. Well, also, because I perform, yeah. I, you know, and I've been writing for so many years. And I knew a lot of people in the book. I knew most of the people that I interviewed which seems to have made it more comfortable for them to tell me their stories, as opposed to, you've been interviewed so many times. It's different when you're being interviewed by someone that you know, sure. as opposed to a stranger. You right. feel oh, same, insanely up. different, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a lot of never-heard-before stories in here. People really opened up, and it was a lot of times it was very emotional. You know, Alan Combs, 
A lot of people don't know. Yeah, he started he's a as comic a stand-up. In the strip. Yeah, yeah stand up. His he son's came, a stand up now, actually. He's he, very, oh, funny. Oh, yeah? very funny. Oh, yeah. He came in wearing his comic strip jacket for 30 years old. It looked like it was brand new. And when he talked about how nice this club treated him, because in the early years, there were no schedules. This was the first club that told comics what time you're going to go on stage. Right. He brought tears to his eyes. He was yeah. sitting there. He was overwhelmed. You sure he wasn't punched by O'Reilly two minutes before that? <laughs> Do you know, I, I personally, <laughs> too. my yeah. claim to fame with the comic book, I think I personally changed the policy, comics drink for free. <laughs> because I would go in there do a nine yeah. o'clock spot on a Monday night in front of eight people and drink absolutes on the rocks till two a.m. and they break even. <laughs> we we got a break, but you were hosting recently. I was. At, yeah. Uh, the book is make them laugh. Make them laugh. Available on Amazon up, everywhere else, it? right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have I a can... copy. It's really good. I it, it, it's you're the perfect person for this, and it's the the history of an amazing club. It's really a great story. And you yeah. gave me a great blurb for the book. Yeah. Jeff has know? a uh, web video blog. Uh, Jeff Gurian's comedy matters. Yeah. And uh, so go to that. That's on the internet. And go get the book. Comedy Matters yeah. TV. You got about 170 interviews with Jimmy Fallon, Chelsea Handler. They're all Handler, good. Yeah, yeah. Artie Lang. I did it. Yeah, the Artie Gotham, Lang right. Did a great yeah. interview with me. I got to do you, Nick. Yeah, sure. Okay, Absolutely. Great. Come on great in, job. brother. Make I'll, I'll hold my breath. Make them no, laugh. No, it's a great book. And, and that's a great club that has more history than any in the city. It is. Thanks, Thanks for yeah, doing it's that. It's a legendary club. Thank you so much. Thanks, Back Jeff. after this with the twins.